In 1968, when I was an impressionable six-year-old, horrified by what the television was showing about the Vietnam War, listening to the Beatles sing All You Need Is Love, my parents bought a book called The Population Bomb by scientist Paul Ehrlich. It suggested that we were running out of resources because our population was growing too fast and we were consuming our Earth's life support system faster than it could regenerate. Two years later, on the first Earth Day, I began my activism, rounding up the neighborhood kids and staging a cleanup of the polluted stream behind our apartment that ran into the Hudson River. A year later, my beetle idol, George Harrison, held a concert for Bangladesh to raise awareness of the suffering there. Like many kids worried about the starving kids in Bangladesh, I asked in school why things were getting so bad. And like most school children around the world, we were told how the population bomb supposedly worked, how it ticked. The idea went back to the Reverend Thomas Malthus, who argued in 1798 that, quote, population increases geometrically while food supplies increase only arithmetically. This has been the prevailing wisdom for over two centuries and is often illustrated by the following graph. Looks neat, right? So mathematically precise and inevitable. The problem is that it's wrong. I felt it as a kid. It bothered me throughout middle school and high school and on into college. The Reverend's now famous Malthusian predictions of doom and gloom came from a man who never studied biology. We now realize that he was a religious zealot and bigot who made up theories to try and stoke anti-immigration fever, arguing that undesirable poor people were basically breeding like rats. The problem in his logic is easy to spot when you use nexus thinking. Food is a population. Food comes from living creatures who have populations. They expand geometrically. If you let them, if you encourage them, it doesn't matter if we're talking about brewer's yeast or earthworms or oak trees or apple trees or chickens or ears of corn or cattle or cocoa-covered ants. Whatever you eat comes from living organisms that are programmed to reproduce as fast as they can. They want to reproduce geometrically, just like us. So, population increases geometrically, whether it is us or our food. Starving kids in Bangladesh or Ethiopia simply shouldn't happen. And I will insist to you wouldn't happen if we allowed the organisms we eat to do their thing. The key to keeping food production in line with food consumption, I have been arguing, is to use the food waste to fuel and fertilizer and food again, or FW2F3, formula wherein every molecule of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and carbon, and micronutrients found in our wastes, in our burgeoning cities, is transformed immediately, in situ, back into food through the magical transduction of anaerobic and aerobic biodigestion and urban vertical farming and micro livestock. Using these simple technologies to close the loops in the food, energy, water nexus, the curves on those graphs should continue to go up and up in lockstep until we reach the limit set by sunlight. And that will be for a long while. And then we'll have to figure out safe, harmless ways to grow not just ourselves and our economy, stupid, but our ecology and eventually help grow new planets. But even that, the promise of space stations and terraforming planets, isn't out of the question. After all, the one thing that doesn't seem to ever be in any danger of not expanding is the universe. A better take, right?